Go check out the film Book of Life in theaters now. The film stars Diego Luna, who gets to sing some modern classics of songs like Radiohead's Creep, Mumford & Sons' I Will Wait, amongst others. The film's songs and score are composed by Gustavo Santiago, and don't miss the beautiful animated musical they put together. Not only Cheech Marin and Biz Marquis doing Just a Friend, but it's music supervised by Guild President John Houlihan. So hooray for Hooli. Hi, I'm Jonathan McHugh from Q-Score. Welcome back. We're lucky enough today to have multi-talented composer, songwriter, singer, performer, Lily Hayden with us. How are you, Miss Hayden? I'm good. Pleasure to see you. Thank Mwah. you so much for All having the way me. from Santa Monica, you made the move today, huh? Yes. yes. Thanks for coming up. My pleasure, thanks. So we don't have a lot of time, so we're just going to jump right into it. So you started, you came up as both a young child actress and you started playing violin early. Mm -hmm. How have those two disciplines been able to work for you in the conquering the film and TV world? How has it, how's it been working? Uh, well, what's cool for me is having been an actress, and my mom was a stand-up comedian, um, I have a sense of timing and sort of dramatic uh, play, I think, that really serves me when I'm scoring. So when I'm scoring a scene, I feel like I'm actually one of the actors in a way. You know, the ghost, um, <laughs> the great chorus in a way. Um, so I think that that's really helped me relate to directors and, and um, I think keep my emotional innocence uh, when I'm scoring so that I, I'm responding emotionally as opposed to just from cerebrally or, you know, just from the composer standpoint. So it really does help. And, and as a violinist, of course, uh, I've played with a lot of people, you know, as a side person, you know, comping with vocalists. And I always think of dialogue as being a song in a way. So I never want to step on the, the lead vocal in a way. And then, of course, as a singer-songwriter, I get to kind of do everything and incorporate the scoring into the, uh, into the song, which is what I think I've done on this new record. So yeah, so talk about the new record. The new record just come out. Just came out a couple of weeks ago. It's called Lily Land, mm -hmm. and I'm and very excited fourth, about it. Fourth it's my studio fourth album. studio record. Uh, it took me six years to make because every time I would uh, get a film, I would have to stop the record, and then I'd come back to the record, think, having thought it was done, and then with the benefit of the what I'd learned on the film and sort of you know the growth, uh, I'd come back and realize that it was not you know, it wasn't fully baked. So I'd go back and I'd revamp it and I'd incorporate, per so in fact, I incorporated a couple of songs that I wrote for films um, into the record. Now let's talk about that for a second. So when you're scoring films, you're, you're there to score, but they also know you're a singer-songwriter, so they like to have your music writing to picture. How much is too much when you're pitching your songs? Because again, you're not really doing that, you're there to score, but how does that fine line work for you and what's the best way, you know, you found to do it? Um, well, I was lucky enough to work with Hans Zimmer a lot um, for for many years and uh, several years, and uh, and I asked Hans what he felt the you know what n pearl of wisdom could he give me, and he said that he was taught from the beginning by a director whose name I've forgotten, uh, but I'm sure very famous, uh, that you fall in love with your star, and basically you do everything to make your star uh, to to serve your star. So I have really kind of taken that to heart and so I never, I, I, I will always watch a film without music to see how I'm, I'm affected emotionally and then I'll watch it with my music and different ideas and if I don't feel as much with my music I know I've done too much. So I, I really, like I said, try to keep my emotional innocence mm -hmm. and so I don't pitch a song if I, if I think it's not right. going to serve. It is that fine line between the right moment to to pitch and it's, not. It's just about, you know, as long as I, I've found, and I'm, I'm still up and coming, you know, done 10 films, but uh, it's not that many compared to most of the esteemed guests you've had on here. Uh, but, you know, I've found that uh, when the director knows that I'm completely his servant, his or her servant, uh, I then they trust whatever choice I make and they know it's not ego driven. Sure. So, you, like you said, you talked about you came up playing with Hans, you played on amazing movies like Pirates, A Couple Pirates, and you played on a Woody Allen documentary. Um, talk about that discipline about playing on people's movies just when you're watching picture and playing just the violin, it's all you have to focus on. How oh. is that? 
Well, different. it's great to be able to just focus on the violin. I also, because I sing as well, um, and I kind of do this sort of playing, singing thing that has, uh, in fact, I'm, I do the playing, singing thing as one of the voices of the mermaids, the spooky mermaids in The Last Pirates. Oh, really? Scaring children in perpetuity at wow. Disneyland. <laughs> uh, but, uh, so I, I, I don't really think of myself as just a violinist or a singer. I think what my, what I bring to the table is that I'm a musical being. So if it's, you know, singing and playing together and making a kind of siren call or just scratching on the violin or using my effects or being unorthodox, because, you, mm -hmm. you know, I mean, I can read and I can be a little violin, you know, girl. Sure. Uh, but I also, I think what, what I love to bring to the table is kind of the overall musicality. And I personally love to work with people who are composers and producers because mm -hmm. they, what they bring to the table is kind of uh, a, a taste, you know, an aesthetic, and, and I can kind of trust that they're not going to overplay or over sing or over right. do, you know, they'll just, they're bringing taste. So how did you make the transition from just playing violin on people's scores to being your own composer and doing your first score? Well, I, uh, I've got a lot of friends who make films and, uh, and friends who are fans of my records, thankfully. And so a friend of mine uh, named Rupert Isaacson, who made a wonderful film called The Horse Boy, asked me to score his film. And, uh, and I, you know, everybody's got a film in L.A. So, you, know, you go to the gas station, it's like, I've got a script for you, you know. <laughs> like, you really, and it's, but you never know. Right. So my friend said, I want you to score my film. And I said, well, yes, call me when it's, you know, when it's done. And he called, and, he, and it was this beautiful film. Uh, and I scored it with my friend Kim Carroll, and a uh, wonderful guitar player uh, and composer. And Kim Carroll's a male, right? Yes, uh-huh. The uh, Irish descent? The Irish composer, I know yes. Kim Carroll. Uh -huh. Good guy. Um, yeah, he had been playing guitar with me, um, and but I knew that his sound was the right one for this film. And I had also not really scored anything, like, on my own computer. So I, and he had, so I thought, oh, this will be a good collaboration. It'll be good, you know. Anyway, so I called him. We scored this film, and it got into Sundance and did really great at festivals and came out theatrically. And that turned into a Sundance Fellowship, uh, which turned into a bunch more films. Right. It's all about getting that one. And, and also, like you said, having a guy like him walk you through the process, which is key. It's really... Um, key. So turning back to your, the record world, you know, in 1997, you signed a deal with a big, big shot label, Atlantic Records. Talk about how that process happened and, and, and that experience and what that did for you. Uh, well, I had been playing with bands. I graduated from college and came back to L.A. I'd grown up here. Um, and the second I started to jam with people, I was just bitten by the bug of of collaboration. There was just no getting around. You know, I, had, I thought I was going to be a human rights lawyer. I studied poli-sci at Brown, actually. Wow. Good school. Uh, they only accept 9% of the people that get in, so you're pretty special. Um, I don't know if I could get in today. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, anyway, so I, uh, I came back to LA and started jamming with people, and it was so exciting for me. And I had been very unpopular child. So being able to connect with people so sort of intimately and viscerally uh, you know, at, just from note one was like, it, it was a completely new world. It was like, you know. Immediate bonding. Immediate bonding. It was so exciting for me and nothing was more delicious than that. So I was jamming with everybody and it turned into collaborating with a lot of different people, uh, getting on a ton of records and finding myself on stage with people like um, Jimmy Page and Robert Plant and uh, George Clinton and Parliament Funkadelic, and uh, and over the years I've gotten to collaborate with all these amazing people, um, uh, Roger Waters and Sting, and uh, a lot of great people. So uh, I was just playing with a ton of people, and I was started writing my own stuff, and uh, and I got a residency at the Viper Room, and that turned into a nice bidding war, which turned into a great. Uh, record deal and publishing deal, which I'm still living on, uh, and um, uh, and uh, and I've gotten I've gotten to do uh, five records now, uh, four studio records. So, so you know, for me, <clears throat> not the first concert I ever went to, 19 something something, Led Zeppelin, Madison Square Garden. You know, one of the greatest things in my life as a, as a teenager, 
Um, talk about the experience of working with those guys and, and, and what that music means to you. Well, funny thing is that I grew up on classical music, so I didn't have it as part of my DNA. And when I was opening for them, I got to open for them on their whole last U.S. tour. Uh, and when I was opening for them and hanging out with them, I, I, who had grown up in Hollywood around a lot of celebrity, which is, I was completely unfazed by it, I saw another level of, uh, of, uh, rock star. of, of rock star, of celebrity that I had never. the highest plane. I mean, people would see them and start to cry and right. like and like shake and you know, it was. So I didn't have that visceral thing when I heard them for the first time. Um, I said, they're great. They are great. I really <laughs> like this. Um, it's like a so total musician thing. It right? was a total musician thing. I mean, I was really, I, w I had done a few, uh, I, as a sideman, I had done uh, a handful of arena tours with other bands and uh, seen how scripted and how, like, by the book and how all the backing tracks and the fake vocals and the whole deal. And so when I saw Jimmy and Robert doing this thing and it was just, it was raw and they were taking chances and they were really inventing it every night. I mean, you know, they had their tricks and their their thing, but it was so inventive and experimental and imaginative, so inspiring. I learned a lot. Um, so I, uh, uh, what can I say? It was a so huge it, uh, paralleling all, all the way up to today, you decided to cover Kashmir from Physical Graffiti, one of their greatest songs, uh, on your record and make a video. So talk about that experience. Uh, well, I was lucky enough to play Kashmir with him. So, so I'll just give you the little background sure. story. I was doing my residency at the Viper Room. Some friends of mine were opening for Jimmy Page and Robert Plant. Uh, in, and those friends were? Uh, oh, yes, uh, the Tragically Hip. Um, oh, Canadian, back, one of Canadian's Canadian finest, band. managed uh, by they Jake Gold. Yeah, and they weren't opening for them in L.A., so they invited me to the San, San Diego show. So I hopped on a train by myself with no plans on how I was going to deal with any of it. Um, you know, you do that in your 20s. Uh, and, you, and I jumped on this train, and I met them after the show and, uh, and gave them a flyer for my show at the Viper Room next night, which you also do when you're 20. Uh, and uh, and I and they came the next no night. Way. They came to the Viper Room. Robert Plant and Jimmy Page came to the Viper Room to see your show. And they stayed around and they chatted with, with me afterwards and said, "Don't be afraid to take risks." And so I we went out afterwards and it, uh, and I said, "Can I sit in with you at the forum?" And they you asked the I question. Asked, I, I you have know, to. What? You got to go for it. Hey, if you don't ask, You're right. it might not happen. And they said. And they said yes. So. Uh, so I play, and they said, well, you know Kashmir, right? And I said, well, of course. And I, I did not know Kashmir. <laughs> um, I had to learn it, and I, and I, but it was so thrilling oh my to God. be trading licks with Jimmy Page, and, uh, and really just a thrill. And then three years later, uh, they asked me to open for them on their, their U.S. tour. That is and a genius story. Yeah, it was really cool. And funny thing is, actually, uh, a handful of years ago, I was touring with, with Herbie Hancock. Um, as part of his band, and I was learning Maiden Voyage on at the soundcheck, mm -hmm. Jazz 101. You'd think I would know Maiden Voyage, and but I didn't. Mm -hmm. uh, and I said, well, you know, that's kind of funny. I learned Cashmere on stage with Jimmy Page and Robert Plant. And he said, yeah, but that's easy. That's just rock and roll. <laughs> that's what Herbie said. <laughs> Classic. So um, let's talk about some of the new films you're doing. So, uh, you know, a couple of them, uh, we'll just pick them off one at a time. Sublime and the Beautiful. Talk about that film and what that, what kind of score you had to deliver for that and how that pushed you. It's a very dark, intense kind of, uh, uh, it's, a, it's a dark film, minimalist. Um, and it's just come out. It's, in, it's got a limited indie release. Um, it's a beautiful film, really beautifully acted, and uh, and I thought I had been restrained, and then the director would come into my studio and say, you know, it's beautiful, but let's take away everything but three tracks, you know. So I I was it, it was a process of stripping down um, and really being as as restrained as possible, and uh, I, it's just about giving just enough. Knowing when to to unleash to, to let the tears flow, um, and to right, there's a really fine line between schmaltzy and just the right thing. Of it's a really good point about how score does that for me. Like I am not a crier in life, but I will. You give me the right score, right situation, a movie, yeah. and I will. 
I'll wipe a couple back, you know? Yeah, totally. Um, but you, you, but there's nothing worse than feeling like you're being manipulated. Correct. Um, so I, I think I've really been trained, you know, as part of the team of people being the instrument that usually evokes tears <laughs> uh, the, with a violin. Uh, you know, when to, how to draw the bow just so that it's, um, it gives you something but it doesn't give you too much and not mm -hmm. too much vibrato but just enough and just at the right second, yeah. you know. it is so um, fine line. So uh, it's really, I'm a very intuitive composer and Obviously, yeah. um, so I, that was an opportunity to be really restrained. Mm -hmm. um, and the funny thing is that uh, the next week, uh, actually this week, it's still out right now, um, there's a, a movie called Hashtag Stuck. Right. Uh, that where I was takes place mostly in a car, or uh, almost entirely in a car, with the exception on the of LA freeway. Of, on the 405, uh, it's a great, most it's crowded, really fun, crowded road in America. Uh, really fun romantic comedy, and I was asked to. The director is a friend of mine, and he asked me to do a sound alike, which I generally don't do, but I'm not afraid. You know, I'm kind of my own person, so I'm very much my own person. So even if I think I'm doing a sound alike, it's totally not. I mean, it's you know, it's me. Uh, but I did this sort of sound alike for to replace what was like a Black Eyed Peas tune or something, where I, like I was the Fergie. So it was the complete wow. diametrically opposed. That's um, fun. That's what's great about movies. You get yeah. to dive into different worlds. I'm doing one Latin movie, one EDM movie, you know, one documentary. It's just all these different worlds that you mm -hmm. dive into. Speaking of documentaries, Anita. Talk about Anita, because that uh, that had a good buzz at Sundance this year, I think, right? Uh, it premiered last year last at year. Sundance. Last year. Um, it was directed by Academy Award winning director Frida Mock, uh, and she did a beautiful film about Anita Hill, the seminal gender activist uh, who really, on whose shoulders so much of the last 20 years of the women's movement has been riding. And she uh, is really inspiring. I didn't know much about Anita Hill. When I when I scored it, uh, it was uh, I had kind of conflated her name with like the Jennifer Flowers or you know like the kind of sex scandal thing, which I generally just block out, thinking it's just a big charade. But what I found out was that she was on a path to being a judge herself um, when Clarence Thomas, uh, what you know, when she was working with Clarence Thomas. But because he sexually harassed her so badly, she just changed careers and she became a professor. And uh, and it took a lot of courage for her to just come out and finally speak out against something uh, about something that uh, so many women have dealt with, you know, throughout, you know, the eons. Um, and so it, she's really given a lot of courage to people uh, to say, you know, what it's not just about sexual harassment. It's about simply human rights. You know, it's just about power. Um, you know, and human dignity. And so that's just a symptom of the larger issue, which is human rights. And that's something that I'm really, that's a real passion for me. Is that a cause for you that you really try to? Definitely. But I, the funny thing is, I, I'm, as a poli sci major, I was really interested in a lot of, you know, in, in kind of fighting for the underdog. Uh, and I realized that that's an issue. You know, human dignity is really the centerpiece. It's the central, the, it's the through line for all of the different co issues that I, um, champion. So I do a lot of benefits, um, but I found that, uh, you know, whether it's civil rights, whether it's LGBTQ rights, uh, whether it's the environment, whether it's women's rights, whether it's, uh, you know, uh, social inequality, wh whatever it is, the essence of it for me is human dignity, which I really found Anita Hill was such a beautiful right. So you really identified well with the score. I really what did. What type of score did you do for that one? Uh, well, we had, they hired me right after they got into Sundance, and I had three and a half weeks to do 73 minutes of music. Oh my god. Uh, no so, time to waste. <laughs> so I, it was like the Hunger Games of, of scoring. You know, I just went into my studio and just buzzed through and just prayed for the muses to give me melodies and, and themes and right. uh, and it was uh, very, they loved my records so I knew that I had a, a good start there so I knew that I could, you know, it, and I can kind of become my own orchestra. I sometimes call my, credit myself as the Lil Harmonic on my records. Uh, so, uh, but generally speaking it was, you know, sort of a chamber music type score uh, with some interesting programming and, um, and sound design which I love to do as well. Great. So let's talk about the new record for a minute. So you're on the you did uh, went to your release show at um, Sayers Club. Sayers Club is a great venue. I love that. 
and you're going to go to New York and do some performances. Tell us about when and where you're going to be performing. November 6th at the Rockwood Music Hall. Great venue. Uh, and November 8th at the Grape Room in Philadelphia. And actually November 4th at, uh, I'm doing a little television show called Live from Center Stage uh, just outside the Boston oh, yeah, area. Yeah. Um, so if anybody's there, mm -hmm. message me and I can get you on the list for all of them. She'll hook it up. Um, so the new record, so you, the story obviously we talked about, about you know, you had some um, things happen to you while you were making the record and it kind of got inside your head, literally. Um, talk about that process and what that took out of you and how it helped you shape the record. So uh, about uh, six years ago, my last record came out. I was touring, I was, uh, I was promoting it, and I started to not feel good in my house. And I, uh, it turns out that there was a generator, the generator that was powering my recording studio was melting. And I was breathing in all these f uh, melting wires. And uh, so my immune system got uh, damaged. And in the process of figuring that out, we unleashed the pesticide that was in the home, in the house that was, uh, and, and I found out in this process that any house that's built between 1948 and 88 has a pesticide in it to prevent termites um, called chlordane and it causes a whole host of problems. Um, and I got really sick and had to evacuate my house, get rid of everything I owned, um, and, the, and I got brain damage from it, pesticide poisoning. And what did um, that, did it slow your mental function? So, uh, yeah, so I, I couldn't process information. I was uh, just really focused on getting well, and so I did all kinds of therapies, did a detox. Um, I tried to save the house, which I was fortunate enough to be able to do. Uh, so I was able to clean the house, and it's totally fine. Um, but I had to get rid of all of my belongings because they were not salvageable. Um, and I had to recover from brain damage. And, uh, and I did a whole host of therapies, uh, but it was actually the process of practicing violin again that rewired my brain. And wow. it was really a miracle. I found out that a lot of people who have been affected by this chemical have never recovered. In fact, most have never recovered. And I had a complete recovery because of music. And I found out I did a TED Talk about it. Uh, which you can find on my website, and uh, and uh, I found out that, of course, I just got distracted, feeling very brain damaged at the moment. Uh, anyway, uh, so I I had this recovery. I found out that uh, music actually causes neurogenesis, and it's the only therapy that literally uh, lights up the entire brain um, in electroencephalograms. So uh, if you know anybody who's ever had any problems, strokes, any kind of anything, right. neuro, uh, music therapy is the most uh, important yeah, and effective Yeah, it's an amazing, amazing thing. There's nothing better than it. So um, would you do a song for us I before we go? I would Thank you. So tell us what you're going to do. So I'm going to do a song for you that you actually requested because, uh, and I remember I had just written a song and you and I were, were... I came to your studio. Uh, you came to my studio. It wasn't even... A bike ride there. You <laughs> rode your bike over to my studio over at Remote Control and I, it was hot off the presses. It wasn't even fully baked. Um, and, uh, and I played it for you. And I was really excited about it and it came, came together and it was the first single for the record. It's called Sea of Gold. It's a great song. And, uh, and it, it's my first song that actually crossed over to commercial radio. And does that, as far as a direction that you want to do more of in the future? Um, I'm not trying to think commercial or non-commercial. I, um, I think of myself as a musical being. And so uh, this is what spoke to me at the time. And, I, uh, and I, I think of my work sort of in tandem with visuals. Uh, so I'd love to see this you know, licensed for a movie or um, it has not been in a it movie hasn't yet. yet. It hasn't well, I'm yet. hopefully going to be the first one to snap I that one up. I hope you are. <laughs> um, yeah, so I, I think of myself as sort of, uh, you know, just a musical being and, and songs being just a different manifestation of the same muse that creates score. So, uh, you know, it's all kind of a spectrum. And what's the song about? Song is about, this, uh, it's called Sea of Gold, which for me is the image that came to me. It's the metaphor for a place where we all connect, where there are no barriers between us. Beautiful. All right, well, thank you so much for coming in. It's so great seeing you again. I really appreciate you being here and singing for us. This is only the second time ever we've had music on Q-Score, besides Gary Calamar. 
and you're a lot prettier than him. So thank you so much. My pleasure. Lily thank Hayden. you so much.
Lily Hayden. Check out her new album, Lily Lands, and uh, check for her on the road, New York, Philadelphia, Boston, and uh, go watch her movie. She's doing some good shit. Thank, Thank you. you so much. All right, Lily Hayden, everybody. Thank you. See you next time on Q Score. For more Q Score, please check us out at EmpowerMe.tv to find out what goes on behind the curtain and how the film and TV music gets made. It happens right here. Tune in.